Hey friends, thanks for joining me, Jim Baroud, to hear a few insights from leaders who represent our innovation ecosystem. Today's chat is with Tom Zaki, who is the founder and CEO of TerraCycle and Loop, and is also the author of four books on sustainability, recycling, and purposeful leadership. James, thanks for uh, inviting me uh, today. It's a real pleasure to be here. And thank you all uh, who are attending. I look forward to uh, chatting with you throughout the day. Um, so yeah, let's let's uh, you know to give a little sense. I'm gonna actually share my screen so I can show you guys some visuals as we uh, as we go here. So let me just get that all uh, moving. Here we are. And just can you confirm it's all coming through clearly? Yeah. Good. Yes. So um, just to jump right in, you know, so the company I run, TerraCycle, uh, has. Are you guys? Oh, we just had a little bug. Okay. The company I run, TerraCycle, has been around for now. I think we're in our 16th, 17th year, and uh, we are a mission-driven waste management company. Uh, so we're all about garbage. It's one of my favorite topics. And uh, we operate today all over the world, uh, nationally in 20 countries around the world. Uh, those are the countries in blue. We even have the TerraCycle Foundation. So we can talk a little bit, if it's interesting, about what is it like to run the, a mission-driven for-profit or a nonprofit uh, doing similar type of work. Uh, so our nonprofit is live now in Thailand and launching soon in India. And, uh, you know, this, uh, uh, you know, the company takes organizations uh, on a path from being linear products, products that today, whether it's a diaper or a, or a piece of chewing gum or a razor blade all the way to a toothpaste tube, how do we collect that? Uh, or how do we move that from a linear system through the journey to a circular one? Uh, so the first step in that process is how do we collect things uh, and make sure that they can be recycled versus ending up in the landfill. And today we run recycling for thousands of waste streams all over the world, whether it's cigarette butts that are today uh, collected and recycled and everything from park benches to ashtrays collected in 400 cities around the world, all the way to aerosol containers that are made into exercise parks, flip-flops into uh, playgrounds, um, uh, uh, aerosol containers, uh, uh, all the way to car seats, we even this year in our division in Japan collected hard to recycle home care waste, uh, like uh, uh, laundry detergent bottles all the way to shampoo containers and made them into quite literally every Olympic podium for the Tokyo uh, Olympics. Even dirty diaper recycling, uh, which is now live in Holland. So our first division focuses on this first question. How do we start bending a linear economy, which is uh, products that have no choice other than to put them in the garbage and make sure they can be recycled and, uh, and, and do that at scale. Our next division focuses on how do we integrate waste back into products and allow products to be made from recycled content? This lowers the need of extracting new materials. Uh, for example, we run one of the world's largest supply chains on ocean plastic and help P&G integrate that into, uh, for example, the head and shoulder shampoo bottle. And now we do that with many, many products, not just from ocean plastic, but to river plastic, rock and roll festival waste, all sorts of amazing uh, uh, material types that would otherwise never be collected. That's the real punchline. And that gets us to what one would call sort of a circular economy based on recycling, which is perhaps the best thing to do with single use uh, products to make sure they're collected and recycled and made from recycled materials. And actually just less than two years ago, we took one step further. Uh, we wanted to de develop our third division, which is how do we move from a recycling based circular economy to a reuse based circular economy, uh, uh, divorcing us ourselves from what we believe is the root cause of waste using something once. That platform is called Loop, and uh, that focuses on thinking about how we used to live. You know, back before the 1950s, we mended our clothing, we cobbled our shoes, we uh, drank milk in refillable packaging, even motor oil perfume was all in refillable packaging. And then, you know, the 1950s came around, and we invented disposability, single use. And uh, the idea of Loop really is how do we combine the benefits of those two things? How do we solve the unintended consequences of disposability while maintaining the virtues? So the virtues are affordability and convenience, and the consequences are the waste crisis and, in fact, a diminishing quality of our products. And by the, the, the big aha was shifting the product, the package, or the product from being a uh, cost to the manufacturer and, uh, and property of the consumer, which is ironic because we don't really want to own uh, a, uh, a disposable coffee cup when there's no coffee in it or a, uh, a, uh, you know, a, sh uh, a ice cream container when there's no ice cream in it and shift it to the way it used to be where those packages could be returned uh, via a deposit method. Uh, so when you return it, you get your deposit back and it goes back to the manufacturer who cleans it and refills it. And that unlocked 
loop, which, create, which, which enables companies like Unilever to make deodorant now that looks like this in stainless steel, or Clorox to make those wipes now looking like this, all the way from your Haagen-Dazs ice cream uh, to your Tide laundry detergent, to your uh, uh, Nesquik uh, from Nestle, even your Cascade dish pods, you know, also back to iconic packaging like Kraft Heinz with uh, its tomato ketchup or Coca-Cola in its original bottle type, really thinking about how to create a platform uh, for reuse. Now, the way Loop works, it literally is a platform for reuse. So consumer product companies can come and create reusable versions of their products. That's the first step. And then we work with retailers to embed those into their physical and digital stores. So today, if you're tuning in from the United States, you can access Loop at loopstore.com here in the US. That's in partnership with Kroger and Walgreens. And soon you'll be able to act, or so you can also access it in the UK with Tesco or in the France with Carrefour. But already retailers are starting to even uh, implement this in store. Uh, a week ago, Carrefour in France started rolling out the Loop display or the Loop products directly in store. So you can buy your herbal essence shampoo all the way to your Coca-Cola in reusable packaging. And when you're done, you put it back into a kiosk at the front of the store and get your deposits back. And you'll soon see that also pop up in the US like this with Kroger and Walgreens. And not only that, in the past few months, we've announced our partnership with retailers outside the grocery and mass market retailers like McDonald's, and Ulta Beauty. And in fact, just yesterday, announced our partnership with Burger King and Tim Hortons, where you will soon be able to buy your hamburger and soda in reusable packaging. And then you can buy at Burger King and return to Kroger and buy a Kroger and then return to Walgreens, trying to make uh, 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 reusable as convenient as throwing something away. And so hopefully this gives you just a little taste because I'm really looking forward to chatting about what you're interested in. So uh, that's why I try not to go too long here around how we're trying to eliminate the idea of waste by innovating around the very concept of it. Um, so I'm gonna pause here uh, uh, and uh, would just love to answer any questions uh, you have and really look forward to the conversation. All right, great. So here is the first question from Clark Lagerman. Um, Tom, who is actually, Clark is part of Scarlet, is a great entrepreneur, and he runs Scarlet Startups, which uh, partnered on this program today. So here's Clark's question. What percentage of items placed in recycling are actually just trash? Um, he said he's heard of some items that, I, you know, you place in a recycling container that are ultimately just tossed in the garbage and cannot be recycled because they are too dirty or for other reasons. Good question. So this is really highlighting, uh, Clark, an important distinguishment between what we put in our recycling bin and what's recycled. Or uh, in a more sort of a professional term, it would be the difference between diversion and recovery. And it's about 50% to give you a sense of it. Roughly 50% of what we put in our recycling bins are not recycled. Now, let's take a step back and dissect that because that seems incredibly negative, and it is. We look at, I think when we, and I say we, you know, manufacturers, retailers, citizens, government, you know, Everyone probably except the recyclers themselves look at recycling as a service to the environment, like doing the right thing. And people always ask, well, can that be recycled? Is it possible to recycle something? And then sort of feel like if it's possible, then the recycler should be, you know, out there recycling it. But that's not how recycling works. Recyclers are for-profit enterprises. They're for-profit companies. So they're only going to recycle what they can make money at. That's it. I mean, I'm going to do a little experiment with James here just for fun. Let's assume James and I are in the same room. And James, this is the thought, thought experiment. I'm going to put an object in front of you. And you have to leave, you know, with it. Like you have to leave with the object. You have no choice other than to leave with the object. And you have to be modestly happy. You can't be euphoric. And you can't be upset. You have to leave with modest happiness. Okay? And I'm going to give you three objects. And you have to tell me there's one thing you can add on in addition to me putting the object in front of you is you can pay me some money or you can ask me to pay you. That's the only like lever you have, okay? So you can pull, you know, do you put some money on the table, maybe to take your happiness down, or do you ask me to put some money on the table so you can take your happiness up, okay? A kilo of gold, what, what amount will you pay me? So you leave modestly happy, kilo of gold. Uh, maybe 10% less than what it's worth. <laughs> okay, so thousand bucks, that sound fair? I guess so. Okay, fine, a kilo of iron. Kilo of iron. No, you're gonna have to pay me. How much? I don't know. Um, 110 percent of what it's worth. Okay, and a kilo of shit. But I'll put it in the bag so it's not disgusting. But a kilo <laughs> of fecal matter. You'll definitely have to pay me. And just for fun, how much? What's your price on a kilo? Uh, Twenty bucks. Twenty bucks. Okay. 
So here is why I did this thought experiment. That is recycling, right? Recyclers are going to go after the gold in this metaphor. In, in pragmatic terms, that's aluminum cans, clear PET bottles, white HDPE containers, uncoated paper, and like that's about it or very little else. Now, they may tell you put everything in the bin, but what they're really doing is saying, look, you don't worry about it. Put it all in the bin. That's called single stream recycling. And I'm going to sort out what, I, what is the gold to me. Everything else in James's example, the iron or the poop would end up being disposed in the cheapest possible way. Recycling is not about doing the right thing to the businesses who do it. It's about urban mining. And that is so important to frame uh, because that suddenly starts lock unlocking everything. It's why, for example, compostable packaging is actually a really bad idea. In fact, most composters don't accept it, believe it or not. 50% of US composters will write on their websites already today, do not put compostable packaging in our bin. Now you'd say, well, why not? It composts, right? But it doesn't, it, it actually hurts their profitability. Because when compostable packaging composts, which it does accurately, it actually de decreases the value of the finished product. There's no micronutrients, no life in it, like a banana peel or coffee grounds. But it increases the cost of processing. You have to spend money sorting out the non-compostable packaging that someone will inadvertently put in there anyway. So that's why composters typically sort it out or ask you not to put into it to begin with. And this is everything about recycling and why you see today a 50% delta between what you put into the recycling bin and what is actually recycled at the other end. Wow, that was, thank you for that really enlightening explanation, uh, Tom. Okay, next question. Do you see the oil and plastics industry as competitors? Aren't they lobbying companies and governments to use as much plastic as possible? Um, no, they're not. They're not competitors. Uh, they're not really engaged, let's say, per se, with what we do, right? So they're neither. They're more uh, neutral to the conversation. Now, in, in full disclosure, Exxon is a partner of ours. Shell is a partner of ours. With Shell, we're doing reusable motor oil containers. Uh, so now your motor oil container in Europe comes in reusable stainless steel. And with Exxon, we're launching some really exciting partnerships. I can't speak about them just yet, but some really exciting partnerships here in the U.S. Uh, uh, in a few weeks from now. Um, so that's just for full disclosure, but generally, if you think about like the oil industry and the, and the, uh, and the refiners like Dow DuPont, you know, who make plastics, um, they they don't really interact with us that much because our first division TerraCycle is out there focusing on how do we collect and recycle as much of that material as possible. And in loop, we're not anti-plastic. There are plastic products in loop, uh, uh, like, uh, the cascade container, uh, is made from durable plastic. What loop is really about is not anti-plastic or anti-metal or any material. It's about anti-single use. And how do we move from a single use lifestyle to a reusable lifestyle? Great. Here's a question about your entrepreneurial experience. And again, you've had a great journey and there's not enough time to get into everything, but give people a sense of the challenges you faced from you know, day one, uh, way, way, way back. Gosh, that's a very good question. Um, Look, I, I would say it this way, you know, we've gone, through, this was the classic entrepreneurial story. You know, I've, uh, 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 in my sophomore year, I dropped out of Princeton to start TerraCycle, you know, the usual, right? Lived in a basement office, went through all the rigmarole, and today we've been, you know, we're now a global growth company uh, and, uh, you know, definitely not a startup anymore. You know, so I, I, we faced all the normal, you know, trappings that you would have in a normal entrepreneurial uh, journey. What I would say is the incremental unique piece is how to grapple with the idea of being a purpose driven uh, for profit organization. And that sort of has it's a double edged sword. It's mostly beneficial purpose, you know, uh, uh, is incredibly powerful. Right. It allows us to attract team members, you know, uh, that are incredible talent, uh, uh, not just on, on on sheer cash compensation. It uh, 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 opens doors for us with partners that uh, normally wouldn't be open. It allows us to be attractive to the media. I mean, TerraCycle's written about, uh, on average, there's about 40 articles a day, every day about this organization and so many other positives. But you also have to steward purpose, right? You have to, uh, uh, you know, edit maybe what you may do. Uh, uh, and it's important that you treat it just as importantly as profit. So that's the real sort of, you know, thing that I learned along the way. And I'll give you one example of this. You know, when we first started TerraCycle uh, and invented something like diaper recycling, we said, isn't this amazing? Diapers make up 3% of landfills. Let's go out to all the diaper companies and aren't they going to be so excited that we can offer them the ability to solve that very important issue? And we, you know, we would get maybe, a, you know, a little bit of programming or something like that, but nothing of real scale, like, like, like where we're moving now on diaper recycling. 
And we realized that if we lead with purpose in uh, an organization, we're going to get in the front door. Maybe we'll get a little something, but it's, it's not the right way to do it. And this is a huge issue in sustainable business overall. Like we, we say the purpose is the reason you know, to do something. And so a client would say to us, we're going to do your program because it's the right thing to do. Now, the, the lesson I learned in that is that when someone says that to you, especially if you're running a mission-driven organization, that's actually code for, I'll do it for the moral imperative, but there's no other reason I can justify to do this thing. It's not going to show up on uh, my P&L. It's not going to make the company, you know, my company more profitable uh, or larger. It's just the moral imperative. But if we uh, reframe that, take diaper recycling, and think about what, you know, empathize with what, say, the diaper companies really want to do. They want to increase their market share. They want to have you buy their brand of diaper instead of someone else's. They're not going to necessarily have people buy more diapers because people will just buy the diapers they need. Uh, but you may buy brand A versus brand B. And when we frame diaper recycling and how it can drive market share in a really authentic way, then the companies start leaning in. And that's what happened. That's how we were able to launch diaper recycling with Pampers uh, in Holland. And now it's expanding around the world. And that is the critical lesson I've learned in purposeful business is if you have to convince somebody to in business, a customer, a consumer, someone has always, you know, has to uh, be convinced to give you money for your product or your service. Like there's a truism in business and don't, you know, purpose opens a lot of things and it's amazing, but don't make that the reason someone should do something, make it how it's going to benefit what they want. A good example of this is say organic food. You know, the people who created the organic food movement did it to help the birds and the butterflies and the bees. I mean, it was for better regenerative farming. But if you ask consumers, the number one reason they buy organic food today, it's entirely because of the, the, uh, the, 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 uh, that it's better for your personal human health. It's not about the birds and the butterflies and the bees. So it's important to accept that and play into that and understand that's how the sort of chess pieces move on the chessboard. And that's been a great lesson for me in uh, starting and scaling a mission-driven organization. And that leads to another question, Tom, as far as, you know, what's the biggest factor of your success? But before you answer that, give folks a, a sort of a sense for when you got started, how big it was then, how big it is now. I mean, you, this is a mature business uh, that's really, in some ways, uh, just a really uh, very impactful, very special uh, and uh, really thoughtfully run by, by you. So talk to us about that a bit. Yeah, I mean, look, at the beginning, it was literally, you know, me in college as a sophomore and some of my friends, right, uh, as a basement startup, literally. Um, you know, and then over time today, we're uh, 400 employees uh, spread across offices in 20 countries. All uh, that's employees that are based in office environments, not taking into account uh, facilities and, you know, all of the uh, team members that support us in logistics or warehousing or processing. Uh, so about 400 people who sit in office environments. Uh, our revenue will be, you know, this year, maybe about 60 million, give or take. And uh, we've only grown every year since we began. Uh, we're profitable. Um, and, uh, you know, we're, we're very much now on, uh, it took us a while to figure out all that right so you know it, it's definitely not an overnight success but what's been really exciting is over the past three years our actual rate of growth has been accelerating which is usually harder to do when you're at a larger size usually it's easy to grow a thousand percent when your revenue is a hundred grand you know um but it's a little different you know to to do that and even in covid we'll have grown 10 percent, which is uh, pretty exciting uh, especially in this sort of amazingly uncertain time we're living through so biggest factor of your success so biggest fact, sorry about that. Thank you for asking. Um, you know, it's a number of different, from a sheer entrepreneurial point of view, I think what really separates, you know, the wheat from the chaff is, I call it the grind, right? Like, it's not the idea. It's how, how willing you are to work ridiculously hard day in, day out, year after year. I mean, my day today, my first phone call was at 5.30 in the morning. That's normal, you know, and it's going to go till 8 p.m. and it's a Friday today. So there is a real aspect here of just the simply the hard work you put into it. And I really don't want to underestimate that because a lot of young folks who look at entrepreneurs and, you know, see us on the cover of magazines and all this stuff think that, oh, you know, you get a great idea and then off you go. That's more like winning the lottery. Those do exist, but that is more akin to getting the right numbers on a lottery ticket. The, the average entrepreneur, it's about how hard you work consistently. And it's a marathon, you know, it's not a, it's not a sprint, but within the context of mission driven business, you know, the, the biggest factor to success is really, you know, not approaching it, uh, in the way normal mission-driven organizations do, 
but approaching it with that empathy to why our partners exist and what they want and how to help them achieve that through purpose. Because I really believe that there are no, well, mostly there are no evil people, right? Like those are anomalies. People are generally good people, whether they work at a big oil company or tobacco company or companies that are usually criticized, the people there are still good people. And they want to do things that will help the world be better. And our job is to show them how they can achieve their goals, not our goals, their goals through purpose. And for us, that purpose is, you know, uh, recycling and recycled content and reuse. And they want to do that if we can really highlight how that works for them. And so we're, uh, that's been maybe the biggest unlocking principle for us by far. Great. So, um, and it, the company started when again? How many years ago? So the idea was, I think, 2003, first year of invoicing. First like invoice we ever levied was 2004. Uh, so that's 16 years. Got it. Wonderful. Okay. So um, here's a sort of a, an aside. Uh, someone is really curious about what's on your ceil ceiling. <laughs> so it's funny you ask. Um, my, uh, uh, this is, it's, it's not a Zoom background. This is just, you know, my office here. Um, at home. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, my entire life, right. I, you know, we do very purposeful things, but most of my job, like as a human is communicating, you know, uh, writing emails, talking to people, having meetings, you know, it's all communicating, communicating, communicating. And I see the scale of our activities on a spreadsheet, you know, uh, like, you know, it's very rarely when we're, you know, collecting diapers, do I actually physically interact with the diapers? Or, you know, when we're collecting ocean plastic, you know, am I physically there cleaning up ocean plastic? It's incredibly rare. And uh, so I miss the, um, the physical creation with my hands, you know, right now I create with my mouth, I guess, and my words and, you know, what, how I communicate. And so my therapy, I guess, uh, is uh, on the weekends. Like as soon as I'm done today, this weekend, I'll be, you know, with my wife and we'll build some aspect of our home. We live uh, right on the river in New Jersey. So I'm looking at the Delaware River outside my, uh, my window and we found the home we want to live in forever. So every room is sort of a piece of art that we've created, you know, as a way to feel like we're actually making something with our hands. So this room's the uh, thesis, it's a little hard to see the way because I'm plugged into it with a lot of cords, but you know, every aspect of this room is like as if you met like a forest wizard in his library at night, if that theme makes any sense. And this ceiling, to answer your question, is a fresco a friend of mine who's an artist from Hungary painted. It's got our kids in it and so on. And it really is spectacular, this particular room at night. Um, or a friend of mine from Bali made this door, you know, that we put up. Um, but every room in this house is that. And it's sort of a nice way to, to uh, you know, play in the idea of creation, you know? So we have a little pottery studio downstairs and like anytime, you know, that's sort of like a therapy, if you will, and physically making something versus just having it manifest through a laptop. I love that. And, and people should know, um, your offices are just extraordinarily creative and fascinating. Ah. And uh, we can show, you know, if you go to the website, I'm sure there's pictures of, of the office, but talk to it just a little bit about your office, which is one of a kind. It is, it is. And I'm going to um, actually, since we're in the, in the video world today, instead of using my words, I'll use some pictures. I'm going to do this real time. So this is unrehearsed. Uh, let's see if we can pull it off. Bear with me here. Let me just first get the video going. I'm going to go into Google so you guys can replicate this at home if you want. Um, so first, I'm going to type in uh, TerraCycle. And let's see offices what come up. Uh, let's go to images. And oh, yeah, here we go. OK, so this is what our office environment looks like. And uh, you can see some images here from all over the world. We're in 20 countries. And one of the, the, the formal details is every aspect of our office must be made from garbage. So you can hear, see vinyl records separate, you know, the areas, the door, the, 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 the um, desks are old doors. You know, the, the floor is remnant carpet and so on and so forth. It goes on and on all over the world. So that's one aspect, which is really, really cool. And it really is the spirit of what TerraCycle is all about. Here's some more office uh, examples. This looks like it's the New Jersey office. But that's the inside. Then let's go, I'll give you two more perspectives. The physical location of our offices, where our buildings, like this is one of our buildings in Trenton, where it's located is always, if we can, in the most down and out cities. This is in Trenton, New Jersey. And if I don't know if many folks know Trenton, but it's the third most dangerous city in America, extremely poor, center of gang violence. Um, and so it's much, you know, we love locating here because our location itself can drive the idea of purpose. And then so the third part, which is really, really cool, is that if you uh, type into Google now, TerraCycle and graffiti. So graffiti is something that uh, is sort of like garbage. People pay to get rid of it. And so we've enabled in our offices that artists can come and paint anything they want whenever they want. 
And this has gotten so big over the past, like more than a decade, that our office in Trenton have become a mecca of graf graffiti artists and the walls outside with really beautiful art, you know, I mean, this is the quality of the stuff. It's unbelievable. And it's thousands and thousands of paintings have been done. It just goes on and on. It's repainted almost every week. Our walls, I kid you not, are this thick of latex, spray paint, latex, right? The latex is the base coat, you know, latex, spray paint, latex, spray paint. Um, and it's this like, you know, this is what I mean on the power of purpose. People come here for free, you know, uh, they, you know they don't, uh, we are the ones doing the, the benefit, giving them a chance to paint. And again, the quality is unparalleled on what people do. And we get thanked for it, which is the crazy part. I mean, I'm just you know, thrilled that every time I go to the office, I see a new piece of art on the outside walls. So this is a little taste into how we, and now what this benefits us by. And like, look, let's, that, that's all lovely and awesome and fun and colorful and exciting and vibrant. So you can imagine how it helps the team members. But let's put some dollar signs on it. By having an office that is really unbelievably cool and it doesn't just attract more team members to join. We've had, you know, uh, it definitely increases the energy level, but it also attracts when media comes, the articles get bigger. When news comes, the features get bigger because it's more conducive to cameras. And that's actually very consciously done. So much so that uh, our, uh, uh, we even had, we don't do it now because uh, it's just uh, uh, the, the, the station that had our TV show uh, went under, but uh, you can go to say Amazon and if you type in human uh, resources, that's the name of our TV show and maybe type in, uh, I think you would type in Pivot. Pivot was the name of the TV network uh, that aired it. Here we go. This is uh, the TerraCycle TV show. We did three seasons of our TV show. Um, you know, and each episode is a half a million dollar production. We get paid for it, mind you. And uh, it is a reality show about what our business is like. And a big aspect for the, for the producers that did this was, it's a really beautiful set, right? So all this stuff actually compounds to, uh, to uh, uh, have business value concretely. And I mean, why not have the world you live in, like whether it's your home or your office, be a wonderland instead of a bunch of gray cubicles in a row. Okay, um, that's really spectacular. I didn't realize how many people come and paint. I remember seeing that one, about one year ago, Tom, when I visited, uh, and it was extraordinary, but I didn't realize the numbers uh, and the frequency by which people paint those walls. So cl clearly when we can all sort of meet in real life, <laughs> We should certainly set up something at your offices to really showcase uh, how special it is. So there's a couple of questions, uh, Tom, about, you know, how do you prioritize your day and how do you mm -hmm. juggle your professional and personal life, which uh, clearly must be challenging because, as you just noted, you are super busy. Yeah, it's, it's, it's definitely a challenge, right? And I would say that in entrepreneurship, you are going to, I think almost, you know, indefinitely sacrifice more. It's going to be more than a nine to five Monday to Friday, right? It just, it just is. It's not an absolute rule, but it's a, definitely a, a generalization that is probably true. And uh, so, you know, something gets sacrificed, right? Um, now, uh, uh, for me, you know, I'm, I'm uh, uh, married. We have uh, uh, two little uh, kids, uh, Jamie and Leo, you know, five and three years old. Um, and so the way I try to balance, you know, having time with my family, and uh, investing in TerraCycle is uh, uh, I really try not to work on the weekends. So as soon as today, Friday will be over, the laptop is shut down till maybe late Sunday night when I get ready for Monday morning. Um, so I really keep my weekends holy and just don't interact with uh, the company. As, you know, I mean, there's exceptions, but I really try not to. Um, I also, you know, uh, uh, just in the way it is, you know, with kids, I, I, if I'm going to work harder, I wake up earlier and then try to always end with enough time to have three, four hours with the kids, uh, you know, before they go to uh, go to bed. So that's why my days just start absurdly early. But, you know, that's that's at least a better way to create more more time. You know, what falls off is I don't have a lot of time for, you know, just myself. Right. I don't uh, I wish I had more time to exercise or like have, you know, uh, personal things. Uh, but, you know, it's something you have to sacrifice something. And this is, I think, one of the important things that I love about having a purposeful business is that because, you know, you get all the, in, 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 in entrepreneurship, when I first got attracted to entrepreneurship, it was for the selfish trappings of fame and fortune, right? Because uh, that, that attracts a lot of folks into entrepreneurship. You know, let's just call it spade a spade. And what's amazing about purposeful entrepreneurship is you get all those trappings, you know, fame and uh, fortune to some degree has already, you know, has come my way. But um, you also feel so great every day you wake up and dedicate to it because there's a greater, greater purpose for what you're doing than just greed. And uh, so, 
you know, that is really motivating. And that really allows me to keep putting a lot of energy into it, not just day after day, but year after year, and for a consistent period of time into the future. Um, and it's this also, you know, the, the other key thing is, um, there's a great precipice, I think, in entrepreneurship, moving from when you start an idea, and you're like a lone horse, or a lone wolf, to building a team, and having the team really be able to go and run the business. I mean, we're now, as I mentioned, about 400 team members. And the, ba the business basically runs itself. What I'm focused on is, you know, how to innovate, how to grow, how to, you know, uh, really take on meaningful opportunities or put out fires. So, and that's so important uh, uh, as a way to, to you know, uh, 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 and that's a huge step. You know, many entrepreneurs uh, struggle with that. I did at the beginning as well. So, you know, if you get a really good team and invest in the team, then it's also easier to balance life. Uh, and you have to do that because it is a marathon. You know, you uh, cannot burn yourself out, right? So, uh it's important to be able to have some balance. And this is at least the way I try to do it. Yeah, Tom, that's, that's really great advice. Thank you for that. So we're going to get to some more questions. So if anyone has questions, please submit them. We're a little over halfway through our talk today. But before we get to more questions, uh, I want to ask you, Tom, give us one thing, uh, one, uh, share with us just one thing that uh, we as aspiring entrepreneurs or innovators or or, or folks working in uh, other organizations or companies, um, you know, um, can live by or, or can aspire to? So I'm going to say this as to us as individuals, not as necessarily business leaders or members of organizations. You know, the environmental topic is a very complex one. You know, how many people easily clearly understand the connection of an orangutan not having a habitat in, in, uh, in a jungle to your shampoo in the morning, you know, uh, and, and how does palm oil factor into that? You know, climate change is a, is a very complex topic, you know, species reduction, uh, global warming, deforestation, and sometimes you do something good here and something bad here happens, right? It's very, very complex and it's so paralyzing, the complexity and the scale, those two things. But there's one simple, unifying thing that brings it all together, that is incredibly easy, which is that every environmental issue that we face, bar none, you know, again, whether you care about garbage like I do, or uh, you know, the quality of our air, or the fact that you know, the West Coast is on fire, or you name it, it's all linked to us buying things. And by the way, I'm a hypocrite. You know, I live in a, a house, I, I buy things, you know, I, I could have a smaller lifestyle and I, you know, that's a major struggle for me personally. So I say this as, as, as not, you know, standing above the problem, very much swimming in it, but our act of buying, every time we buy something, we're voting for more destruction on the planet to occur. And there's no such thing as good consumption. Nothing I showed you in that preamble is the answer. You can't recycle your way out of it. You can't reuse your way out of it. I mean, even the most, you know, uh, uh, ethical uh, way to grow beef, let's say, you know, if it was grass fed, you know, loved and everything, that pasture could have been a rainforest, right? There's no such thing as good consumption. And the problem is we are simply over consuming like crazy. And here's a crazy, and here's a statistic just to, you know, put a, put a nail on the head. A hundred, you know, 1920, hundred years ago, not that long ago, um, an average uh, female consumer would buy two apparel items per year and use them on average 20 years before disposal. That's just 100 years ago. Today, uh, that same consumer buys 66 apparel items per year, that's 33 times more, and uses them on average for three uses before disposal. And then just multiply the human population by 10x, just to add a little you know, sort of cherry on the cake. And that's not just, it's everything has gone that way. Who has cobbled their shoe recently or mended their clothes, you know? Um, Think about how many socks someone had in their drawer 100 years ago than today, right? It's absolutely insane how we're gorging ourselves on consumption. And so what is the one action to James's question that we can do is stop buying things uh, 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 and realize if we do buy that whatever we're buying is a vote for the future. More of that will appear, whatever we buy, and less of what we don't buy will disappear, or more of what we don't buy will disappear. Because it's not big companies that are manipulating us into buying things. We are voting for the future we want with what we buy. And there's a great anthropological, you know, sort of idea. You can go in, in any country, take a moment and go into a local supermarket and notice what's on the shelf. And not just what is on the shelf, but how much of 
what is on the shelf is on the shelf because that is a direct reflection of those people's desires. And it's going to change region by region because it, people's desires change. And let's realize that, that yes, we're going to vote in two weeks in the U.S. and for a very important election, but we vote every day with money for the future we want. It's actually a much more important vote. I think that's really a thoughtful response, Tom. And, and actually, during a pandemic, now is when we could sort of scale back a little bit or take just a small step and reduce our consumption, right? Or at least put that into action. So let, I think we should, you should, ch- I, you, me, we will challenge ourselves to buy less and everyone who's listening in. How's that sound? That, that sounds good. All right. So next question. Someone said, why aren't college campuses using your systems or your, you know, uh, your partnership programs? Or are they? They, they are. We're in the U.S. alone, I think, in over 5,000 campuses use TerraCycle systems. We're in 75% of K through 12 schools. Um, so uh, uh, it is actually quite robust. Um, if you want to, you know, use our recycling services, you just go to TerraCycle.com. You type in a waste stream and there's over 100 free programs that you can, we cover the shipping. We even donate uh, a small donation for every piece of waste or kilo of waste you collect to a charity or school of your choice, noting we've donated uh, uh, $45 million so far in these donations, so it's substantial. Um, uh, uh, Loop uh, as well, uh, that's newer though. Uh, you can check out loopstore.com if you wanna see what that's all about. But uh, the TerraCycle platform, the collection and recycling platform is in you know, quite a lot of educational institutions. And uh, uh, you know, if you're out there, check it out, sign up and use one of the free services and why not, you know? Sounds good. And speaking of college, someone asked, do you have any internship or apprenticeship yes, opportunities? Yes, totally, totally. TerraCycle has a very, very robust internship program, uh, both local internships at any one of our offices from Sao Paulo to London to Tokyo, Sydney, you know, uh, Toronto, Trenton, um, uh, but also remote internships as well, especially in this time of COVID. So uh, if you go to, I believe, the careers page on the TerraCycle.com website, you can learn a lot about our internship programs. But uh, there is quite a robust one. And we do hire quite a lot of interns. I mean, this year alone, we added about 80 new jobs. We'll do that probably close to 100 new jobs next year. Um, And I think about a third of the hires come from interns. Wonderful. That's really great news. Um, Top three book recommendations. That's a good question. So I'm going to give one book recommendation, Uh, just transparently. It's ironic. I've written four books, but I haven't read a book in a decade. You know, just uh, this is you asked earlier about sacrifice. That's a good example of what I don't. I wish I had more time. I do read a lot, but not uh, like articles and so on, never books. Um, But my the book that really got me into all of this uh, purposeful capitalism is a is a book called Natural Capitalism by Paul Hawken. And uh, uh, it's a wonderful book on uh, how do you use business as a force for good? Because I do believe, you know, in the end, business is the most powerful tool for change. It is more powerful even today than disease, than politics, than war. Just think about what a global CEO, how many lives he or she can affect in the snap of a finger without any regulatory oversight all over the world. The problem to me, and this was a great turning point for me, you know, as a uh, as an entrepreneur. I remember this so clearly. You know, at the beginning in my high school, I you know was into starting companies and so on. But again, it was for the trappings of fame and fortune. In college, I remember this huge turning point. I'm in my first class. Uh, I was uh, economics 101, and the professor gets up on stage, first class, right, and asks a very appropriate first question for the first class: What is the purpose of business? And the answer she was looking for was profit to shareholders. And like, that is the actual answer, but I was like, oh God, that's super uninspired. And uh, I, I, that is what started having me think about how do we, it's, how can profit be the reason of being? I think profit is critically important, mind you, but it's an indicator of health. It's like our heartbeat. It's like our body fat. We don't have either of those, we go dead, right? Just like if a company doesn't have profit, it dies. And if it has profit, it's gonna flourish for a very long time into the future. So to me, profit is an indicator of health, not the reason of being. And that was now sparked also by the book, Natural Capitalism, that great turning point where I would never start a business now unless it was fundamentally purposeful. Great, great. So um, speaking about entrepreneurship, talk to us about, you know, recommendations you do give for people who are entrepreneurs, people who are considering entrepreneurship, you know, especially during this you know, crisis we're in, uh, clearly you have a lot of experience through the ups and downs of the past 17 years. What advice do you have for for folks? Um, So like I said at the beginning, like what the lesson to me, it's not the idea you have. It's not like some miracle concept, you know, that is suddenly going to make you, you know, tons of money. It's the hard work. 
because you know you're going to learn you're going to pivot you're going to i mean we started literally as a worm poop company if you you know i'm, I'm not going to go into it as much now but if you look us up we literally started as a company taking organic waste feeding it to worms bottling the worm poop and use soda bottles and that was terracycle literally even terracycle is originally wasn't supposed to be a recycling idea it's earth cycle worm you know it's uh, the logo is literally a worm in case anyone knew that's how i drew it at the beginning was intended to be a worm it now looks like a really cool recycling logo so we got lucky but it was supposed to be a worm and um, so I think, you know, the biggest recommendations I would have are first, don't think too much, just start. You know, uh, uh, in Buddhism, they have this great saying that if you think about an idea, you're putting out like one unit of energy. If it's just in your mind. If you speak it, you're putting out like 10 units of energy on that idea. But if you do it, you're putting 100 units of energy out if you action it. And so action is everything. And I would stop thinking, stop musing on the idea. If you have a product concept, build a prototype. If you have a service idea, start pitching the service. Because what's going to happen if I have a product idea and I say, James, what do you think of my product? And you go, well, I don't know about this or this or this. Then now I know what I have to fix. I'm going to fix all that and say, now what do you think? And at some point, you're going to take out money from your pocket and buy it. And I've got a sale. And then I'm going to multiply that and grow. You just got to go. Too many people think too much. And you got to jump in into the deep end and start. And the beauty is you're going to learn everything because you have to. You're going to learn what a balance sheet is, what a PNL is, what is it like to hire people, fire people, grow an enterprise and, you know, maintain an enterprise, you know, uh, open in new countries. All these things will naturally emerge because you're going to face them as you start actioning. But you got to start. Uh, you got to start. Just start. You know, like that's it. That is the fundamental thing. And then when you do, make sure you realize what you've signed up for, which is this marathon of a grind and just be prepared and go. And it's and literally day in, day out, work really hard uh, at it. I think another really, let's give you one other piece of advice that's been really true for me, which is if some, if you run the idea by somebody and they uh, say it's such a great idea, they've done you a wild disservice because you've learned nothing at all. But if you go to someone and they shit all over your idea and they say how horrible it is, and this is what's bad about it, and that's what's bad about it, your emotional reaction is going to be probably anger. You're going to be like, oh, this person doesn't know what they're talking about. Screw them, blah, blah, blah. And it is actually really hard to give critical advice. And it's hard to hear it, but that is what you should honor deeply because that is what you should fix to make your business better. I'll, I'll give you a concrete example. I have entrepreneurs all the time ask me for guidance. And if I'm not really into their idea, I'm going to tell them how good it is so I can get off the phone and just move on. But if I'm into the idea, I'm going to rip it apart for an hour uh, telling them all the reasons it sucks. And that's how I, I, I would honor their idea. And if, they've, if they're going to take anything from it, they're going to think about how to improve their idea based on the feedback. And that is so, the, the negative, the negative is, the most, is the best information on how to learn and how to get better. You cannot get better on positive guidance. It's just an ego boost in no direction. I think that's, that's really special advice, really. Get started, number one, right? And also get the critical feedback, and push for yeah. it, right? Yes. In case they're not getting yeah. it, someone's just yesing them. Actually ask, really, please, tear apart this idea because that will help make the idea better, the venture better, and, and, and motivate them to, to sort of pivot if they need to or, exactly. or, or get started. So that's great. Thank you for that. So uh, we're still light waiting for a few more questions, but while we do that, we spoke about Davos last time we, uh, we saw each other in real life about a year ago yeah. and you went last January. So tell us about, tell us, you know, what you've learned from going to Davos several times, you know, as far as um, how it's benefited you personally and your company. Yeah, so I've, I go to the World Economic Forums, uh, which is in Davos, Switzerland, uh, you know, so many times, uh, 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 gosh, maybe every other year so far. Um, and uh, it's an incredible, you know, opportunity uh, for, for us because it's the gathering of the world's leaders, you know, political leaders, uh, business leaders, NGO leaders, you know, it's basically the who's and schmooze of the world in, of business and enterprise. And it is a wild, surreal experience. You know, you're in line with Bill Gates and, you know, as you go to the bathroom, Sir Richard Branson is walking out. These sort of things occur there. But for us, what is, what is, what is really important of it beyond sort of the, the, you know, the spectacular nature of the thing is that it, it, it's a great moment for us to bring breakthrough ideas to the world. So in January of 2000, it always happens in January, in 2017, at the World Economic Forum, we launched the world's largest ocean plastic supply chain. Uh, then in 2019, just after we spoke, 
we launched Loop, which became the number one sustainability story globally in 2019. And actually, I was looking it up today. Over 7,000 articles have been written about Loop uh, since then. Uh, it's absolutely mind-numbing. And uh, uh, Davos, for us, is a great opportunity to sort of use the world stage to put out these ideas and generate unparalleled uh, momentum. And, you know, we're the smallest fry there relative to these other organizations and the type of revenues and uh, systems they command. So for us, it's a, always a great privilege and honor to, uh, to be there. Well, that, that's really great, great insights, uh, Tom. We have a question about, you know, your accomplishments. So is there anything you haven't accomplished yet that you're still working on? Tons, you know, our mission is to eliminate the idea of waste. We're really a long way to go. Uh, in fact, we're probably going in the wrong direction. You know, during COVID, we've increased disposable consumption by 30%. You know, we're not only the face masks we use and the gloves, but the food we order from restaurants is now not on, you know, and we don't eat in on reusable dining wear, like plates and cups, but we eat out on single use uh, dining wear. Um, we have increased our disposable consumption 30% and we're actually decreasing our capability to recycle. As oil prices go down, which they have been and uh, exacerbated by COVID, things become significantly less recyclable because it's less profitable for garbage companies to recycle. So the world that is going in absolutely the wrong direction. And so we have this huge hairy mission, you know, which is what we're focused on. And we have a tremendous, we're just scratching the surface to be honest, compared to the size uh, of the issue. And that's just on waste. So, you know, um, Gosh, there is now on the other side, you know, it's been pretty amazing. Um, you know, we've uh, had a chance to run a global enterprise, you know, uh, everything from write books to produce a TV show to all sorts of different things. So it's been a phenomenal experience of learning and growth for me. Um, but I don't, you know, it's, uh, uh, this is one of those missions I don't think I'll accomplish in my lifetime. So I just hope to do as much as I can in the short period of time I'm able to, to work on it. What about personally, Tom? Um, you know, it's fun. I've, uh, uh, you know, I came from uh, poverty. I, I grew up in, uh, or was born in communist Hungary, uh, you know, before the Iron Curtain came down, left, uh, my parents left when I was four uh, as political refugees. You know, we moved around and landed in Canada as, as refugees. So I understand the really uh, empathize with the refugee story and the immigrant immigrant story that is uh, unfolding today. It's really unfortunate what we're, what we're doing. I was very lucky to be honest, though, even back then America didn't let us in Canada did. I just, you know, came down here to the U.S. Uh, for school, for college, uh, many years later. And, uh, 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 you know, I, 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 let's to be very honest, I had, you know, at the beginning, entrepreneurship attracted me because I came from communism to capitalism and entrepreneurship. The American dream is an entrepreneurial dream. That is, you know, the American dream is racks to riches. And how do you do that through entrepreneurship? I mean, that's it, right? And I loved it. I was like, oh, my God, I could do all these things, access these things, uh, you know. And what's amazing is at this age, I'm, I think I'm 30, 38 now. Every material thing I've ever wanted in my life, I have, you know, um, there's nothing else I want. I'm, I'm good. Um, so and, and a lot of the things that I always wanted to, you know, to do for my ego, right, um, you know, be on the cover of magazines or, you know, all these different things I've, I've, I've you know, achieved. What, what is great about that is I've been able to check those things off, um, you know, and those are very vapid uh, uh, things. But, you know, the ego is a driving force. Um, and I'm now really focused on this idea of how much can I scale the purpose that I'm focused on, you know? And um, one of the bad things about business is it has an infinite appetite. And that's one of the things, the problem of capitalism is that we're on a, the, it's not about how big you are, it's how much bigger you are today than yesterday. That's what the stock market is gonna value. That's what, you know, people always focus on is growth, growth, growth. And of course, you know, I'm sure you've heard the truisms of how can we grow infinitely on the finite planet, right? It's, it's not possible. Um, but one of the beautiful things of purposeful business is that the more you grow, the more good you create, right? And for us, if we get to the extreme on this, we would actually eliminate the, our reason of being, which is pretty amazing, like make yourself irrelevant, right? Solve the problem. So that's what I'm very much, you know, focused on. And, uh, uh, and it's been nice to at least get all the ego stuff out of the way so that there's more clarity towards, you know, what I want to really put my time against. What about habits? Are there any habits that have changed your life? You know, the, I'll tell you the, 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 it's not enough as a habit per se. Um, but one of the things that helped me, I think, you know, do what I do the very best was in the sports I was really into in, uh, you know, when I was younger, um, were all, and I, and I reflected on them later, you know, the sports I was super into were swimming, cross country, were the two that like cross country running, swimming. And what's similar in those sports is they're 
um, sports where you have to put in like, like a steady grind, you know, with no other reinforcement. Like if you're going to go in a pool every day and swim two hours every day, you, there's nothing to see, right? Um, your goggles are probably fogged up. It's the same back and forth, you know, so it's very monotonous, right? And you can't even talk to anyone. It's very much in your mind. And what it teaches you, and it really taught me, was this ability to, to grind. You notice I keep coming back to this idea of the grind. And, you know, even in our team members, it's one of the biggest things that, that, that creates success. It's not how talented you are, you know, how smart you are, any of those things. It's how well you're willing to really put your head down and do the work. And this is so important to center on if you're focused on entrepreneurship, because it's mostly about that. The irony is that's what people never talk about. They only ever talk about like, you know, the certain, you know, the pivotal moments, right? And then the, then, you know, like the, the really sort of horrible moments, the big moments, and, you know, usually successful people tell the stories. Like, you know how history is written by the winners? The entrepreneurship, entrepreneurial journey is told by the victors, but only one in 10 entrepreneurs, you know, or startups even make it, right? I, I think there should be a lot of, it'd be really interesting to really tell the entrepreneurial story is mostly a story of failure, right? And this goes back to that thing about critical, you know, criticism. I get asked all the time, what's your biggest failure? And it's like, what a bullshit question. It's like, you mean today or yesterday or like the past year? Like we fail all the time. But the thing about failure is the first time you fail, it's, it's, I sort of view it as tuition. Every time our company has a challenge, I mean, we had just two this morning. I always, you know, we'll go into the meeting, we'll solve all the challenges. I'm going to say, okay, this thing cost us, you know, maybe a quarter million dollars. What did we learn from it? What are we going to do differently? Because then that quarter million dollar loss is, is tuition. I'm just thinking, what is tuition? It's a, it's a money to produce nothing other than learning, right? Nothing practical comes out of tuition except becoming uh, more enlightened. Now, this, if you make that same mistake the second time, then that is a fundamental screw up and you should be really upset about it, right? But the first time, it's an investment in learning. And any good idea is built on a mountain of failure, right? And it's, 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 I share this because that's usually not what people end up talking about, right? It's, uh, and it's so important to know, you know, to honor that and embrace it and not to be scared of it, not to reject it, because that's when you're going to do the same mistake again. That's really, that's really impactful, uh, Tom. Thank you for sharing that. The grind, right? And I used to swim, so I can relate to that. Mm. <laughs> and and le learning from failure, very important. Okay, so we're winding down uh, this show. Tom, why don't you uh, share with us a poem? Absolutely. Bear with me here. So this is a fun little poem uh, that I found by Anonymous. Work while you work, play while you play. One thing each time, that is the way. All that you do, do with your might. Things done in halves are not done right. Wonderful. Great, great way to end. Thanks for joining us. I hope you enjoyed the show. Please like it, leave a review, and subscribe. See you soon.